So that's the first thing I'd like everybody to know that uh, I will not be able to manage the space in the sense of watching for hands or questions or things like that. Um, fortunately, I have Mackenzie for that. Uh, Mackenzie will be watching for hands and if hands are piling up, she will call my attention to it. Uh, by the way, if that doesn't happen, we'll also be okay because this is structured with some natural breaks uh, at sort of the one third and two third parts where we'll just stop for some questions or discussion anyway. Uh, same thing with the chat. Chat is open to everybody. Feel free to type questions or thoughts or comments into the chat, but I won't be able to monitor it. Mackenzie will be doing that for me and she'll interrupt me if she judges that an interruption is necessary. And if not, we'll still have breaks at you know one third and two third where I'll get over to the chat and see what I see. Uh, I am going to ask Mackenzie to start with a chat just so you can see her name in chat. Uh, I think she's pretty easy to find on the screen, but just in case, Mackenzie, if you'll toss something into the chat just by way of introduction. Uh, and that is the introduction of Mackenzie Phillips to the group on the screen. I'll introduce myself. I'm Doug Bullock. I'm an associate dean in the College of Arts and Sciences. And I was not going to do any other introductions. I'm sorry to everybody else whose faces and names are on the screen. Uh, I just a little more time than I want to spend. So that's just a little bit of structural formality. Uh, other structural formalities, uh, uh, this is being recorded, and I believe the recording will be made available on the college website at some point. Uh, Jeff Oliver handles those things. He's also on the screen. And the slide deck will be made available uh, on the college website for you know, anybody to look at later. Again, Jeff will make sure that that happens. I don't know how it happens or where to look for it. Uh, Jeff will help you out if you need to uh, find out where. So. Um, towards the end of the formalities now, but one more, uh, I mentioned slide deck. Yeah, sorry. I know that this got advertised on places like the CTL website as a workshop, but I think that's uh, putting too fine a point on it in terms of pedagogy. Uh, frankly, it's a slide deck and I'm going to talk. Uh, sorry for the experts in teaching and pedagogy on the screen for me displaying this completely a non-interactive or non-active learning environment, but this is kind of what I've got ready to go here on a Tuesday via Zoom. So slide deck and me talking and maybe Mackenzie watching for hands and questions in the chat. Um, that said, um, probably we should get started. I should share a screen and get a slide deck in view. Uh, let's see, here's a slide deck. So this causes my little window of faces to turn into a vertical bar. I slide it all the way to the left. So it covers up the useless part of the PowerPoint stuff. And by the way, it's going to look like this. I am not going to turn the PowerPoint into the slideshow version because that messes up all of my Zoom all the time. It's going to be looking like this with the sidebar, which is a good place to put the pictures of people's faces if you want to slide it over there. And well, that's what I've done. I hope what you can see is a big, you know, rectangular slide with a tiny amount of text that says Bronco Budget 101, part one. Bronco Budget is not revenue. And I'm going to jump in and cycle through some slides and talk a little bit at you. So Bronco Budget is not revenue. Why not? Well, to start answering that question, I'm going to go back to what budgeting was like before there was Bronco Budget. And really what budgeting is mostly still like pretty much everywhere at Boise State. Boise State uses a thing called, um, uh, well, actually, before I say that, I should also say some vocabulary. I'm sorry, I'm going to talk fiscal years. I can't get my head to do other things, uh, and I abbreviate them with FY, but if you're not used to fiscal years, they're just academic years, and the bit is that the, the number 18 is the spring term of the associated academic year. So what I'm talking about here on this first slide is way back to academic 17, 18. Way back in academic 1718, this was in fact the college's budget, 41 million and change. And the only reason to show you a picture of the FY18 College of Arts and Sciences budget is to point out that the basic budget principle that still governs everything around here is incremental budgeting. And by incremental budgeting, what that means is that a year later, your budget is pretty much last year's budget plus a few increments. So this is what happened when we rolled over from FY18 to FY19. It was a perfectly ordinary incremental budgeting year. You start with your FY18 budget and you make some small changes, most of which are actually driven by, uh, by salary increases or fringe changes, although there's a handful of other things that can change to your permanent budget incrementally from year to year. 
That's a perfectly ordinary budget year. Last year, plus a bit. Well, you hope it's plus a bit. Some years it's minus a bit. Increments can go both directions. But in this particular year, FY18 to 19, we were plus a bit, mostly CEC. So that's normal budgeting. Increment from last year's budget by a little bit. So it all comes Bronco budget. Uh, so when Bronco budget came to us, uh, here's what it added to the mix. First of all, it added a principle that uh, it takes two years of data for there to be a third year of actual impact in Bronco budget. So the first time there was actually anything going on in Bronco budget, we took a bunch of FY18 data involving essentially enrollment, student credit hours, how many majors, how many graduates. The FY18 data established some FY19 targets, which in turn could have an impact incrementally on the FY20 budget. But this three-year kind of cycle, 18 data, 19 data, FY20 impact, you should kind of have that three-year cycle in mind as you think about how Bronco budget behaves and how it affects college of arts and sciences budgets. So I mentioned that FY18 determines an FY19 target. Um, in some sense, that's all it does, but it's even less than that. So here's what all that FY18 data did. In fact, I'm going to scroll back to it. This FY18 data had about uh, a little under 200,000 student credit hours, a little under 5,000 majors, and a bit over 1,000 graduates. There's formulas for all this stuff in Bronco budget. Maybe people have heard the $130 per credit or something like that. Yeah, sure. 1,992,000 1 student credit hours times $130 comes out to be about $25 million. Um, but again, it's, it's not really budget or value, and it's certainly not revenue. It's just a formula that says this many SCH are kind of valued at this many dollars. And then similarly, majors are valued at a certain amount, uh, 800 per major, and degrees are valued at a certain amount, a little over two grand per degree. And it all adds up to about $32 million of value, or I don't know if value is the right word, but it's not revenue. So really, I should have said more about that. All these numbers kind of go into a formula and become 32 million. But here's what that 32 million actually is. It's, um, it's part of the FY19 budget in the sense of, uh, well, okay, the FY19 budget was already done. Before you did any of this Bronco budget machinery, before you even went back and got FY18 data and used it to set an FY19 target, yada, 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 the FY19 budget was already set. That was the point of my first two slides. FY19 budget was set via perfectly ordinary incremental budgeting, the same way it's been for years and years and years and years and years. After the FY19 budget was already established at $43 million. Along come all these formulas, $130 per credit, 800 per major, yada, yada. And the result of those formulas is you take the already set, already determined $43 million budget for FY19, and you color $32 million of things orange. And that's it. That's all that happened when we turned on the Bronco budget switch. A pre-existing $43 million budget became two colors, but still exactly the same $43 million budget in FY19. So when we turned on the Bronco budget switch, the first thing that happened is nothing, no change to the FY19 budget. So what does actually happen? Uh, well, first of all, nothing to get to FY20. Uh, and then we'll maybe kind of look ahead at the FY20 increment. And I say increment because Bronco budget is now turned on, but we are still in an incremental budget model, meaning the FY20 budget is going to look a lot like the FY19 budget, and there will be some small increments as we move from 19 to 20. As it happens, the FY20 increment included a Bronco budget effect. Uh, as I mentioned in a previous slide, FY18 data sets an FY19 target. And then there's one more piece of information. In addition to the FY19 target, which are these numbers, which I've just highlighted in gray, there's the FY19 actuals, which aren't quite the same. We missed 
our FY19 target. We came in a little low on SCH and we came in a little low on majors. And uh, as it happens, um, the Bronco budget, the budget office just decided to declare our degrees flat, even though they weren't. So we can pretend degrees didn't happen that year. But we missed our targets by a bit. And those missed targets cost us a little bit of budget, $130 per missed SCH and $800 per missed degree. And again, that's not per SCH or per degree, it's per how much you missed the target. And it all amounts to an increment of minus $350,000. So that's what Bronco Budget actually did shortly after the switches were turned on and the paintbrush came out and painted that $32 million of FY19 money orange. As we rolled from 19 to 20, that orange money incremented a tiny, tiny bit down from 32 million to 31.65 million, which is rounded off. By the way, all the numbers in this entire slide deck are rounded roughly to the nearest $100,000. Um, sorry, I just didn't want to fill it with decimals. So by the way, while all that orange stuff was going on and there was a downward increment of about $350,000, all of the ordinary regular incrementing went on from FY19 to FY20. There was a CEC and there were some fringe changes and there was the usual stuff running around. So the actual COAS budget went up to about 45 million in FY20. And what happened is the blue dollars went up by a little over 2 million and the orange dollars went down by a little bit. By the way, on the right, I have an all blue graph. I mean, in some sense, that's what the world would have looked like if there had been no Bronco budget ever. When we got to FY20, we would have had a perfectly ordinary incremental budget year up to 45.3 million. And the fact that we didn't have an ordinary year, that we had a Bronco budget year means that was uh, kind of notched back a tiny bit, right? $350,000. But the big thing to know about Bronco budget here is it's just one more increment in incremental budgeting. It happens to be an increment driven by what was your FY19 target? Did you hit your FY19 target? And then there's an FY20 increment in response to that. So that's how the machinery works and what it does as part of incremental budgeting. I've added this slide. This wasn't here when I gave this talk on Friday. And here's why I added this slide. Over the weekend, I got an email from a person who made exactly this mistake. So that, okay, I'm gonna write a slide around that person's mistake. By the way, if you're in the audience, um, thank you. It was a very instructive thing that you sent me. Um, I'm not gonna name any names though. So here's an example of how Bronco budget is not revenue. So let's suppose the Department of Basket Weaving has this lecturer, John Doe. And John Doe is quite a productive teacher. He knocks out eight sections every year of Basket Weaving 101. Those are three credit courses and they always fill like up to the capacity of, I don't know, 25 students or whatever the department sets. Okay, John Doe generated 600 SCH. According to Bronco budget formulas, John Doe generated $78,000. And the important question to ask and answer is how much revenue did John generate? And it is really, really important that everybody understands the answer is none. John did not generate any revenue. John contributed a tiny slice of the total COAS obligation to continue hitting that orange target of $32 million. It's not revenue. It is meeting a pre-existing obligation baked into our budgets when the orange paintbrush came out and colored $32 million a new color, and also set us a bunch of targets for SCH and majors and graduates. By the way, the reason this is an important point is because the mistaken email I got this weekend was from a person who proposed to use the $78,000 to hire a new line. To which the answer is, sorry, it's not revenue. You can't hire a new line. You are not generating revenue with this. You are meeting the $32 million obligation that is now baked into the College of Arts and Sciences. Uh, Charles so has a question about if our 32 million target is static or dynamic. That's a great question. Let me do my recap slide and we'll cover it in the break, which is seconds away. Well, minutes, I talk slow. 
So recap of part one, Bronco budget is not revenue. That is the most important point. Um, what it does instead of generating revenue is it colors your budget in two colors instead of the usual one. One color just goes about its normal business of incrementing normally. The other color increments based on enrollments, which is a new thing. So we've added one more incremental device to the normal suite of incremental devices. Um, another important thing about the second color of money, the orange dollars, is that as soon as those things are painted into place, they are a permanent obligation for the College of Arts and Sciences. And um, I would add one more point to the recap slide, which is that anybody who thinks that Bronco budget will pay for it is almost certainly making the mistake that I've alluded to elsewhere, the mistake that, hey, it's revenue and it will do something. It's not revenue. It's just meeting an obligation. And no, it won't pay for it. OK, so that's the end of part one. And now is a great time for questions. Uh, Mackenzie said there were some. I'm not going to shut down the screen share, but I think I can find chat. There's just the one from Charles about static, Got it. Or static or dynamic. Well, Charles, it's dynamic in the sense that in the first year, we missed it. Uh, and in some sense, it's dynamic in that, OK, at least the, the, the upside of that is it reset our baseline to 31,650,000. And so we're only obligated to then hit that target next year. But that's also just another way of thinking about um, increment upon increment year after year. Um, the other way to say it is that, sure, it's dynamic, and now our target is lower. Yay, that's good. But that $350,000 is gone permanently, and the only way you can get it back is to um, increment it back up. And Charles has asked the next question, which is obvious. What if it goes the other direction? Uh, yay, if it goes the other direction, then you had a positive year, you had a growth year, and new budget came to the college, which I guess you could maybe think of as revenue. But you have then also reset your baseline, and now that's your permanent obligation. So good for you. What about random fluctuations? Um, that's the content of almost all of part two. So I think I will get to Charles' question uh, in some depth in part two. Uh, also, um, any hands? Did you see anything running around? OK. Not at all uncommon based on what happened last time. Uh, this bit is usually a lot of, OK, yada, yada, he's talking. He won't shut up. Um, not very interesting. Uh, my experience is that uh, it's the second part that these audiences find quite interesting. So we may have more questions as we get into part two. We've, we've got one more question. Um, the obligation oh. is to whom or to what entity? So the oh. obligation uh, of each uh, department goes to uh, the dean, yeah, 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 and the yeah, dean yeah. is obligated to the university. Yeah. So, yeah. So, when I wrote the word permanent obligation on this slide, which is still visible, what I meant is that the college has a permanent obligation to the university, and the university enforces that permanent obligation by incrementing our budget down if we don't meet it. An hour means the college budget. Again, much more about this in the second set of slides. There actually is no mathematical obligation on departments. Again, much more about this in part two. Uh, so maybe we should just get there. But I'll also answer Dawn's question from the chat. Um, annually, Dawn, every year there's a, a budget cycle. So, Although I think it's also related to Charles' question, which is what about random variation? Because there is quite a bit of random variation. <laughs> So I'm going to slide on into part two, which I think addresses a number of the questions that have been asked or alluded to. So part two, Bronco budget in departments, which is way more interesting to these audiences than the first stack of slides. Um, OK, so I'm going to start with some general principles about Bronco budget in departments. And then we'll get on to some specifics. And I think most importantly, what are department responsibilities and obligations? But general principles, the most important general principle is that Bronco budget is not a department level thing. It only operates at the college level. In fact, there is a line item in the college budget that fluctuates up or down based on Bronco budget that it is specifically in Leslie's portion of the budget. It is completely separate from any departmental budget. Um, now, it is the case that Leslie's budget moving up or down may cause Leslie to go, hmm, I think some of these effects should pass through to departments, and those could be upward effects or those could be downward effects. But they are not formulaic. There is no Bronco budget formula for a department. Instead, what there is is a Bronco budget formula for the college, which affects Leslie's budget, 
And then when there's an effect on Leslie's budget, she might want to sit down and talk with the chair about what effect this maybe would have in a department. But that's Leslie having a conversation with the department chair or Leslie and myself having a conversation with the department chair, not a formula and not an automatic increment to any departmental budget. And the third really important principle is that even though Bronco budget does not operate at the department level, uh, departments do in fact have a lot of responsibility and need to know a few things about what's going on here. Uh, frankly, departments are where all of the decisions really get made about well, what's gonna happen in a college or at the whole university. And when you're making decisions at the department level, you do need to be aware of how your decisions affect the college budget which in turn may necessitate Leslie having a conversation with you about how that might affect your department. So you need to be aware of the impacts of your decisions, even though Bronco budget does not operate at the department level. So what does happen at department level? Well, okay, I mentioned that there are responsibilities, right? Um, uh, chief among them, like I say, Bronco budget writ large is, it's a permanent obligation upon the college for the college to maintain enrollments uh, in all three areas, in student credit hours, in total number of majors, and in total number of degrees granted. So obviously the college doesn't do that directly. The college relies on departments to do pretty much everything, but particular to Bronco budget, there are three key responsibilities that the college expects of and relies upon departments for. And the first is to maintain your course capacity, uh, at least at whatever level students showed up to take your classes, say, last year. Uh, in some sense, more generally, you're obligated to maintain your student credit hours as a department. But honestly, the, a, it's not mathematical. There's no formula. There's no baseline mark that you're supposed to hit. And you can't really be held responsible for things like, I don't know, students just aren't so interested in basket weaving this fall. Or they wanted to take underwater fire suppression or something like that. I Fine, the basket weaving department will have a few, fewer SCH, no fault of their own. But what is obligatory for the department of basket weaving is that they continue to offer sections that meet last year's demand. So what a department is responsible for doing is not kind of self-inflicting SCH wounds. Uh, if students want to take a thousand seats of basket weaving, you better offer a thousand seats of basket weaving, not 800. Just if there's demand for a thousand, offering only 800 would be kind of a self-inflicted wound. Um, and of course, uh, responsible number two is we need majors. Uh, uh, the departments need to be recruiting and retaining their majors, which again, I think everybody is aware of, but it's just, it's a general responsibility that attaches to departments and would attach to departments even if there wasn't a Bronco budget, but now it has a direct impact on the college's budget if recruitment or retention does not go well. And of course, it has a positive effect on the college budget if recruitment and retention do go well. And then the third responsibility is that departments should be on the lookout for growth opportunities. Uh, if you see one, you should probably try to latch onto it and see if you can actually go capture some growth so that we could have a good effect on the college's program budget. So primary responsibility, maintain capacity. And then of course, keep, uh, keep majors, go get majors and maybe find some other growth opportunities if you see. So that's a recap of department responsibilities. And I'll say again, none of these responsibilities are driven by here's a number you have to hit or here's a formula that's going to attach to you or going to affect your budget. Those things happen at the college level. What happens at department level is we expect you to be aware of these responsibilities and to make decisions accordingly. And if necessary, we may have to talk to you about how things are going. All right. So what actually happens to the dollars? Um, so I mentioned that um, the Bronco budget does not attach to departments. The formulas don't go there. They come to the college. Uh, in the first year, those formulas produced a net minus $350,000 for the College of Arts and Sciences. So I want to talk a little bit about what that actually does in real terms to our operations or to what we can get done with our budget. So it's a real loss in FY20. Uh, it is definitely not offset by just having more blue dollars. Granted, the blue dollars got bigger in FY20, but Truth is those blue dollars got bigger in FY20 for uh, pre-allocated purposes. Again, mostly faculty raises, staff raises, uh, fringe changes. 
And you can't go in there and go, oh, I'm going to use some of this to offset that minus $350,000. I mean, you can't just go say, ah, no, no raises for you. I'm offsetting my Bronco budget. That's just not how the increments work. The blue increments are pretty much locked away and they're kind of already allocated. And that means the orange downward increment, you got to take that loss somewhere. By the way, you, sorry, that's the wrong pronoun. Leslie has to take that loss somewhere. Because Bronco budget operates at the college level, not at the department level. So what does happen at departments if it only happens at the college level and it was minus 350,000? So here's a sketch of what actually does happen in departments when the number is down. Mostly nothing. I'll say it again. Bronco budget is a college level phenomenon, not a departmental level phenomenon. The only time that Bronco budget attaches to a department is when the college looks at the number and goes, hmm, I think we need to do some pass through to departments with this particular number or with some piece of this number. But that's the college taking an action, not Bronco budget taking an action. Mostly, the college does not pass these effects on to departments. And in fact, in a down year, the college works really, really, really hard to not pass any effects on to departments. That's why I say minimal to none. In fact, I think uh, in the first year, I think the correct answer is just none. No down impacts on departments. Uh, Leslie ate the whole loss. Um, There's some reasons why in any down year, department impacts will be minimal to none. Uh, one of the reasons is that whatever is going on at the department level, it has much higher variance. Uh, Charles alluded to year over year variance. Uh, very much true. Uh, there is also department to department variance, which is actually quite volatile. In fact, I'm going to skip off this text based slide and go ahead to just a graphical slide. Not because I need you to read this graph. I just need you to get an eye on the volatility and the variance. So this graph is. Mm, I would say about 40% of the actual FY20 uh, increments. If hypothetically, we just applied the formulas to departments. And it is immediately clear from this graph that even applying a muted partial version of the formula to departments, you get ridiculous answers. Um, you get negative numbers that are staggeringly huge and no department could absorb that in a single year uh, as a down cycle. There would need to be some damping or smoothing. Even the kind of moderately sized negative bands are about 50 grand. That's firing a lecturer. Uh, it's just, it doesn't make any sense to run these formulas just straight into a department and say, ah, oh, departments, yeah, here's your cut, go figure it out. And it doesn't work the other way either. Uh, the positive numbers, if you were to just drop this cash on the department, they wouldn't be able to operationally do much with it at the moment that it dropped. It would take some time. And in fact, this all argues for take your variance and your volatility and smooth it out. And the first thing that happens is, A, it's already smooth. It already happened only at the college level with an aggregate effect of minus 350. None of it happened to departments. It was all smooth at zero for all departments. But the second thing is variance over time. If we are going to do any pass through to departments, positive or negative, it needs to be smoothed out over time. You just can't run the formulas for departments. You get these nonsense numbers. You get much too high of volatility, much too high variance in the numbers. So again, the slide is just to give you a picture of the jaggedy variance. I'm going to go back to the text now. Uh, in a down year, what happens to departments? Again, minimally or nothing is what happens to departments. First of all, because there's high variance and we have to smooth a lot of it. Um, by the way, if you have successive down years in the department, that might trigger one of those conversations. Again, no formulas, no direct pass through. Some evidence that it's time to talk to the dean. That's the departmental impact, a conversation with the dean. Uh, another thing that minimizes impacts on department is that the, the COAS just acts as shock absorbers. Uh, again, this first year, Leslie just absorbed all the shock. 
no pass through to departments. Um, the budget office also can absorb shock, although uh, they do it less often than the college does. The truth is even departments can absorb some one-time shocks with carry forward, but with uh, kind of a last resort. The point being, there's at least three layers of shock absorber. First, the college, then the budget office, and finally, maybe a department that smooth out the impacts if there are any at all on a department. And then finally, the third bullet point is just a restatement that it, it does not make any sense whatsoever to do direct pass through of Bronco budget cuts or gains. It doesn't make any sense to just take these formulas and apply them to the department. You get completely nonsensical answers. And so we just don't. So another way to say it is, and I'll say it a few more times, Bronco budget does not operate at the departmental level. It is a college level phenomenon of which a very small amount might pass through to a department in some special cases after we've gone through all the shock absorbing and the damping and so on. Uh, and then finally, um, time variance. Uh, all this stuff varies over time. Uh, if we have a down year, uh, the first approximation is Leslie tries to eat the entire loss, we just wait for an up year. That happens. No effects on departments. You don't even have to know about it. You wouldn't have had to even have heard of Bronco budget, it would have had no effect on you. And in fact, that's what happened in that first down year. Leslie ate the whole loss, and we just waited for an up year. So departmental impacts, not much. By the way, you still have responsibility. You're still responsible for maintaining enrollments, maintaining capacity, at least last year's capacity, recruit and retain majors, and of course, watch for other growth opportunities. But those, uh, those responsibilities are not enforced by pass-through of Bronco budget effects. If anything, they're enforced with uh, a conversation with the team. Parents of all, have seen this. Okay, so suppose it's a good year. So mostly I've talked about this one down year that we had right out of the box and the impacts on departments being essentially zero. Um, what if there's an up year? What are the impacts on departments? Uh, where's my revenue? Well, um, a lot of good news in the down year. Nothing bad happens to you. But offset by some muted good news in an up year, not much good happens either. Uh, again, the first principle for the college is to be a shock absorber, to damp variance. And so uh, because we're doing a lot of damping of variance, or we're just taking a loss and waiting for an up year, uh, we can't then also just pass through Bronco budget growth to departments dollar for dollar. Again, if you just run the formulas for departments, you get these nonsense answers. So if we're going to have shock absorbers at the college level, we can protect you from almost all the downs, but we also have to hold back some of the ups. There is one thing that we do, though. Uh, the third bullet point here, um, anything that went on growth-wise in a department that made new costs of instruction, maybe you just added sections of stuff, uh, absolutely this passes through. And so cost of instruction reaches departments essentially as fast as departments grow their instructional needs. And that's, that's a clear positive pass through from Bronco budget. Actually, uh, this happens even in a down year, the Bronco budget uh, cost of instruction is gonna come to the department anyway. And if it's a down year, that's just more damping that the college has to do. The fourth bullet point is probably one of the key disappointments for the college in all of Bronco budget, which is that there are times and places where departments are out there growing their major or having more majors or having more degrees granted, which create possible growth in Bronco budget. I wanna stay a long ways away from the word revenue, but it could contribute to a growth year. And it would be ideal if that could pass through to departments. And it turns out it's very, very difficult to uh, functionally pass that through to departments. Again, a lot of it's because we're doing a lot of damping and shock absorbing. Um, the other part of it is that, uh, again, the formulas, the formulas don't work very well. They produce these kind of nonsense numbers. So you need some more muted way of passing through information about majors and degrees or passing through dollars. Um, I'd say right now, all we managed to do is pass through dollars that are associated with student credit hours or associated with new instructional costs or new sections of courses, which you probably have if you've got a growing major or you're growing your number of degrees. But I'd say this is insufficient and it's a sort of clear gap in college policies. 
I will say that uh, Leslie's strategic plan, which is essentially finished, uh, including uh, a number of action items and to-do items, uh, very high on the list of to-do items in Leslie's strategic plan, is to create a more operationally sound pass-through model for this and for other revenue sources that flow through the college. So we are actively working on it, and we are simply not done. Uh, and at this point are not doing a good job of passing through majors, degrees, growth to departments. Should we happen to have a growth year and should you happen to be a growth department? All right, other things that happen. Oh, this is it. This is the recap. Bronco budget is a college thing. It does not happen to departments, period. If anything does happen to you, it was because the college had a conversation or a discussion or an action to take place with you, not because Bronco budget happened to you. Uh, one of the reasons Bronco budget doesn't happen to you is because the college softens all the impacts, moves all the variance. Uh, and while we're doing all this, we at least pass through instructional costs. So if you have new costs of instruction, that's supported. Now, Despite the fact that the effects don't come to you, you do have responsibilities. So the usual three things, maintain enrollments, uh, recruit and retain majors, keep an eye out for growth opportunities. All of those responsibilities are necessary. It is necessary that departments assume responsibility for these things so that the college budget will remain healthy. Uh, so it kind of goes both ways. The college protects you from all the variants and vicissitudes and swings in Bronco budget, but you need to support the college by working on these three responsibilities. So that's the end of part two, which usually uh, has led to a few questions, because uh, this is about department stuff. Do we have questions, Mackenzie? I haven't been looking at chat or anything. Um, Charles asked if we're maintaining course capacity of one academic year ago, but I think you answered that earlier. Yeah. yeah, Charles, that's the basic target. It's the most numerical of all the things in here, which is just look at last year's numbers and try to put that capacity out there, or last like term or whatever you like to do when you're building a schedule. And then I wow. did not see hands go up. Not so many other questions. Oh, here we go. Dan Scott, expansion funding. Yeah, it's point three on the previous slides, Dan. This is trying to pass through the costs of any new instruction that you're doing and then trying to stabilize it or make it permanent. So. And then who sets our targets, Doug? Uh, well, the initial target was set by, a, okay, so the college target. The college targets are absolutely formula driven. They are just this number of dollars times SCH and this number of dollars times majors and this number of dollars times degrees. Um, uh, so when you say who sets our targets, it's just that, it's a formula. There isn't even a who. In fact, I think one of the things the budget office likes about this is that no person is actually responsible for this. It's just a formula, so no one gets tagged. Um, there you go, it's a formula. If the question was about who sets our, meaning the department targets, I'll say again, you don't really have that. Uh, you do have this responsibility to maintain enrollments, a responsibility to maintain capacity that matches what students actually wanted to take from you last year. So in some sense, your last year's enrollment, you can think of as a target when you're planning uh, this year's or next year's schedule. In that sense, your target is just set by student behavior. You know who showed up to take your classes? Jay Chul has asked an excellent question all about quantity, what about quality? Um, uh, again, uh, feature or bug, you decide. For the budget office, I think it's a feature that it's only about quantity and they don't have to worry about much more subtle things like are these good SCH, are these useful SCH, are these things we should be doing relative to our values? Um, the model explicitly tries to stay away from that. So yes, Jay Chul, always about quantity and no, nothing in Bronco budget is about quality. But actually this touches on one of the, I think, deeper, deep S issues with Bronco budget, which keeps coming up in these and other meetings, which is, okay, so, so how, come, how come nobody seems to care about the rest of our mission? The things that we value and want to do, like research um, or creative activity or the service that everybody is providing to their students, to their profession, to their community, to each other. Um, so Bronco budget, if you just look at Bronco budget and the formulas and the verbiage will leave you with the impression 
that nobody cares about those things. Um, that's not true. Uh, for example, uh, your dean cares wholeheartedly and vitally and all the time about things like the research mission and the meaning of arts and sciences and humanities in the world and the value that all of you bring to shoring up and perpetuating that meaning. And that's okay. It's perfectly fine for us as the professionals and practitioners in this space to embody our own commitment to those values and to delivering on that kind of quality and that kind of meaning. It's just that while we're doing it, we gotta keep an eye on our enrollments or there will be a slight downward increment in our budget, which we will deal with. And we will deal with it presumably without saying, oh, I guess we will stop doing research or something like that. Um, so the, the, the budget, it creates this obligation to keep an eye on your enrollments. It does not say, and stop caring about the other stuff. In fact, you should continue to care about the other stuff at exactly the level that you have always cared about it and probably at the level that brought you into this kind of business in the first place. Um, Ronco budget is more my problem. But do keep an eye on your enrollments, please. And keep a kind of breast of those three responsibilities for maintaining enrollment. Okay, any other questions or should I go on to part three? We're ready for part three. All right, part three. Part three is short and just math. And some people just tune out because they've heard the part they care about, which is how does this affect me and my department? So part three is the actual numbers. So I've talked all about you know, um, some kind of general principles and some specific examples from the very, very first year that had this downward increment of minus $350,000. The Bronco budget has been running for three or four years now. Uh, and here are the actual numbers across the entire time that Bronco budget has been running. So year to year to year to year, incremental budgeting every single time. Year to year to year, increment the blue according to normal stuff, is raises, fringes. Every once in a while, the provost actually funds one of our singular strategic budget requests that all goes in the blue increments. And at the same time, year to year to year, orange increments based on did we or did we not meet or exceed our prior year target. And so what I've done with the four oranges is I made the first one kind of a lighter orange to point out that that was sort of fake orange. It was like, just get out a paintbrush and paint $32 million orange to get ourselves going. But every year after that, the orange is sort of real. It's, it's, this really did happen because our enrollments did fluctuate. So from 19 to 20, there's that tiny, small downward increment of the orange. Uh, from 20 to 21, that was a nice juicy increment up an orange. Uh, minus increment in blue, sorry about that, COVID and whatnot. Um, sorry, in blue. I, and then, uh, then another slightly down increment, uh, you know, we fluctuate and you should, the orange stuff should fluctuate. It should be slightly volatile. There should be some variance and that's fine. The college should smooth it all out over time as well as across departments. And in fact, if we just take this thing across orange to orange to orange to orange, uh, there is a kind of net or aggregate after it's all smoothed out. And across all those years, the grand total is plus 500 grand to the college after all those ups and downs. <laughs> Now, there's a tiny problem with that. We do push through to departments all the costs of any new sections that they're operating, and that's cost us a million dollars. So actually, the college is behind already. Um, even though we're ahead, we're already behind. Um, uh, another reason you should never think of Bronco budget as revenue, and you should also never make the mistake of thinking Bronco budget will pay for it. In actual fact, Bronco budget has paid about $500,000 towards a million dollars in costs, which means we're net negative half a million for the college since the inception of Bronco budget. It's not revenue, but it does not accrue to departments. It happens to the college. It does mean that the college has to have soaked up $500,000 in losses across all these years and not passed them on to departments. Yeah, that's true. We have done that. Leslie has absorbed those losses and has not passed them on to departments. I'm going to also drill a tiny bit into that 
net gain of 500,000, which in actual, sorry, total gain, gross of 500,000, net of minus 500,000 uh, with another slime. So uh, these orange increments, which have come out to about plus 500 grand over three or four years, uh, they come in three flavors, SCH, majors, and degrees. And um, here it is broken out by SCH, majors, and degrees. So across those years, all that fluctuating orange, uh, our SCH up about 7,000, which is worth a million bucks. Um, but our majors are down a couple hundred and our degrees are down a hundred, which kind of is another almost half million. So that's how we get to that net gain of 500,000. There is one scary, scary thing though in the 700,000 uh, new SCH. I'm gonna try to do some highlighting again. I'm gonna make some gray. So that net gain of 7,200 SCH actually involves a windfall of over 10,000 SCH that were simply dropped upon us and were not engineered because we went out and found growth or found new majors or did anything. Um, extended studies dropped over 6,000 SCH on us by just getting out of the business of doing, uh, uh, what is it, uh, remote campus -y type stuff. They just quit, we took it over, 6,000 SCH. Uh, we also, a uh, state board assigned uh, the entire state, every institution, a requirement that every student takes three credits or two credits of oral communication, which for us, we've turned into a three credit COM 101 or social. So that's a brand new requirement, which of course brings new SCH to the college. But it's not because we grew or because we took action or because we found majors or found students. It was just the state set a rule and boom, here's 4,000 new SCH. So we got more than 10,000 new SCH just because stuff kind of dropped on us. While those drops were happening, we managed to lose 5,000 of our own. So our sort of normal, just going about our business as a college of arts and sciences, uh, we've actually been bleeding away SCH, about 5,000 of them, while we've been bleeding away majors and while we've been bleeding away degrees. So this is actually not, although a quote unquote net positive across the history of Bronco budget, not actually a pretty picture for the college. Uh, we have been slowly losing students on sort of all fronts. And then we've got offsetting this 10,000 SCH as kind of like a sort of one-off windfalls. In fact, generally we're down about two or 3% uh, kind of over time. Um, it's not bad, but it's real. Uh, and, you know, it's the sort of thing that probably in a sustained way would get to be troublesome. And it brings me back to the key element that actually matters for departments and Bronco budget. It doesn't affect you. Bronco budget is a college level thing, not a department level thing. But you do have responsibilities and they are to maintain your enrollments, to recruit and retain majors. And I think that's actually gonna get more and more important over time for the college. And to look for growth opportunities. If you see a chance to grow something, maybe we should go out and try to grow some. So there's also a recap of this, but it's a recap of the whole talk. Now what? What do we do going forward? Uh, well, if you're a department, number one, recruit, number two, retain. Because honestly, we could use a few more majors around here. I would help out a lot. Um, I would also like for departments to continue to keep an eye out for growth opportunities. Um, by the way, if you see a growth opportunity, call me. Uh, one of the things that I do with departments is they, hey, hey, I have a growth opportunity. And I go, oh, I can, I can fund that at least to get it up off the ground and see if it takes root and actually produces growth. So you see a growth opportunity, you give me a call. And then of course, the fourth thing that is on the to-do list is uh, for the college, not for the departments. Uh, the college does need to think harder about a more robust pass-through model that does a better job of kind of actually doing the things that we really care about and not and res respecting quality as Jay Chua pointed out or any of the other values that we wish were respected by Bronco budget and aren't inside the college because Bronco budget does not happen to departments, we can set up our own preferred structures for how the college actually moves departmental money around, which is in the strategic plan we're working on. And that's it. That's all I got for this little presentation.